Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we had just a handful of folks um, register, um, but I know that people have been accessing these recordings after the fact. And so we're going to go ahead and um, walk through the entire workshop. I know uh, Kalimba, um, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, some of what I cover might not um, apply to you depending on the, the courses that you teach. But again, I want to share the information um, so that those who access the recording later have it. But yeah, well, this will be pretty informal. Let us know if you have any questions or anything's unclear. Um, so our workshop today is digital resources to support student research. Um, my colleague my colleague Eric and I um, are going to be walking through this workshop with you. Eric is our university archivist, so he's going to be talking about some um, digital archival collections and I'll be talking about library instruction resources. Um, if you have attended any of our workshops in the past on incorporating library resources, um, some of what I cover might be a little bit of repeat, but some of it will be new. So let me check that chat real quick here. Okay, perfect. Um, and before we dive in, I'm going to go ahead and pull up um, the flyer that some of you might have seen already. Um, and just let you know what's coming up in our summer faculty workshop series. So um, next Wednesday, my colleague Stacy is going to be covering online course readings, um, how to use library books and articles. There's some specific things you need to do as far as linking. And so she'll be covering that as well as a bunch of other stuff. And then um, the following Wednesday, August 12th, um, our colleague Kim um, is going to be talking about copyright in your course and looking at fair use, which has um, certainly sort of surfaced as an issue in this uh, era of mass online teaching, right? So she'll have a lot of good stuff for you there. And you can um, register for either of these workshops um, on our workshop calendar um, on the library's homepage as you did to get to this one. All right, so I'm up first. Let me go ahead and pull open my browser here. <clears throat> we had a poll, but because we have um, so few people here, I think, Eric, maybe we can just go ahead and skip that for now. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be walking through some instruction options um, that we have available. So um, if you go from the library's um, homepage here to services, if you go all the way to the right here under services for for faculty, um, I'm in, going to navigate to request an instruction session. Now, if you haven't used library instruction before, um, what we do is we will work with you one-on-one um, -on -one to create a session for your class. Um, and this can be tailored to a specific research assignment that you're having students doing. So maybe you're having them do um, a literature review on ancient Egypt. For example, we can work with you and um, come to your class and in, in this virtual world that means come through zoom um, and actually walk walk your students through how to use our databases, for example, um, it can be something a little more abstract like maybe you want your students to learn um, a little bit more about the peer review process so we can design a lesson around that um, really we work closely with you to tailor that um, for whatever your, your goals are. So I won't go through this form in detail, um, but I do want to point out at the top here, this is new information that we've added to our website. Um, if you teach a first year GE course that has a critical information literacy outcome, and that includes um, our written communication, the English course, um, oral communication, which um, comes out of Com Studies, History of the United States, or a first year or foundation seminar. Um, those are the courses that we're, we offer a library ambassador visit to. Um, our library ambassador program is a partnership with undergraduate studies. And essentially um, library ambassadors are CSUSB students who participate in um, our student mentoring program on campus. So they're leaders, they're highly trained, they're highly responsible, usually um, upper division experienced students. And they'll actually meet with your class. And again, in, in this, this era, they're gonna be doing that virtually through Zoom. And they'll give a, about a 45 minute presentation um, about the library you know really basic sort of how to find books articles uh, items on course reserve as well as services that are available it's not any sort of um, in-depth research 
but it provides a really good introduction for students um, for whom all things FAT Library are new. Um, we do uh, usually uh, assess this program and we, we always get really good feedback from, from both faculty and students alike um, saying that they learn a lot and really appreciated it. So if you're interested in that, um, I have a link here to the virtual um, library ambassador form. And this just has you fill out information about your course and when you want the students to um, join your class and things like that. Um, currently, just due to funding um, restraints, this program is available only to those four classes I mentioned, written communication, oral communication, history of the US, and first year seminar. Um, so <clears throat> If you're not teaching any of those courses and teaching something that's um, 200 and above or 2000 and above, um, this, this, this form is what you'll fill out here. So you'll complete your contact information, the course information, preferred date, and this here is important, the preferred mode of instruction. So as I mentioned, um, we will meet with, with your class online through Zoom for a synchronous session. Um, but our other option down here is um, no, no mode. You actually would prefer a, a pre-recorded video for something asynchronous. And so we can work with you on that too. Um, you know, maybe you're not meeting with your students regularly or want to make sure that this is available to them throughout the semester. That's something we can do. Um, we do ask that this form be submitted at least a week in advance. Um, and I would ask, especially if you want a pre-recorded video as soon as possible, just to give our librarians time to prepare. Um, we ask then that you attach either an assignment or submit three goals um, or th three objectives or three things that you want your students to learn. The more specific, the better, of course. And then you'll submit this form. This form goes to me. Um, I'm the coordinator of library instruction. And so what I will do at this point is I will identify um, a librarian who's available and best suited to work with you to teach um, this library instruction session. Um, and then I'll put you in touch with that person and you and that librarian will, you know, talk, talk about the details and figure out who will set up the zoom link and things like that. So this is a great resource for you to take advantage of if you haven't um, in the past. So I'm going to go back here to the library's homepage. Um, I'm going to go back to where I was before, but I just wanted to walk you through how I got there. Go to services. And on the bottom right, I'm going to pop into CIL lab under services for faculty. Um, CIL lab is stands for critical information literacy. And this is really a teaching and learning toolkit for faculty for instructors. Um, and we have a lot of good stuff here. Um, I won't go through all of it, but the one I wanna focus on today is this tab instructor's corner. Now, um, instructor's corner contains readings, um, videos, activity prompts, infographics, a plethora of resources that you can use um, as you are crafting your own assignments um, and your own course, your own syllabi. Um, and if you're interested in integrating critical information literacy or have a research assignment that you'd sort of like to pump up, I highly recommend you um, checking out these materials. You can see that these are organized by SLO, Student Learning Outcome. Um, these are the library student learning outcomes. So we have five here, free versus fee-based information. Um, so that really addresses sort of the paywall phenomenon and, and scholarly information being behind a paywall and some information not and ask students to think critically about that. Um, effective searching is, of course, sort of the mechanics of how to effectively find information as well as some of the um, affective skills or affective uh, qualities that it takes to be an effective searcher. Um, popular, oops. Slow three, popular and scholarly sources, um, really asks students to think about uh, the utilities of these and the differences. Four is what shapes information. This is probably my favorite one. This, this is the really uh, sort of critical one, in my opinion, that gets students thinking about what are those forces that shape the information that's created? Um, political bias, economics, uh, you, you know, and the list could go on and on. So really, really good stuff here, um, especially for discussion. And then five is attribution, which is everyone's favorite citation. So I'm just gonna pop into this one so you can see what you'll find. 
And so at the top, um, we have the student learning outcome written in full. And then, as I mentioned, you're just going to see a bunch of resources here. So we have discussion prompts, class activities, a little did you know section, um, videos, and then a bunch of related resources, which includes library guides, uh, more, more video tutorials, PDFs that you can hand out for your class. And then here we have um, a couple of infographics. So please um, go ahead and explore this. And if you have any questions, um, you can always contact me. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and put my own email in the chat here. Um, your FAO librarians are always happy to work with you on assignment or assessment design. So if you're interested in that, like I said, reach out to me and um, we'll either be working together or, or I'll put you in touch with a librarian who can do that. Um, if I hover over instructor's corner here again, I won't go through all of this, but we have um, recommended readings and videos. So that's essentially pulled from all these SLOs in a nice list format. And then we have CL, CIL assignment ideas from faculty here at CSUSB. And so uh, this is another place where if you're looking for ideas on how to integrate critical information literacy into your course, check these out. Um, you can see that they're listed by last name and then in parentheses here, it has the actual course. And so we have um, different disciplines represented here. These assignments um, come out of professional development opportunities we facilitated with faculty. So we um, were running a grant program through for a while. These top two came out of um, a couple of workshops that we had in support of folks um, transitioning into our new GE program. So um, also here, really good, really good ideas. And if you have, if you see one that you like and you have questions about it, I'd be happy to connect you with um, the, the faculty member who wrote it so they can give you more information. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to pop over to our next resource, which is video tutorials. Um, and these are really popular, especially we've seen usage increase a lot now that we've all we've all transitioned online. Um, but you can see here that we have three, one for beginners, intermediate and advanced researchers. By beginners, um, we generally mean first year students or maybe transfer students for whom um, the FAO library and its, its resources are completely new. For intermediate research researchers, um, we're thinking sort of upper division students and then advanced researchers might be graduating seniors working on capstone or graduate students. Um, the nice thing about these tutorials though is that they're all broken up into components. So if I look at two here, I see peer review, this is a video, and it's, it's a maximum five minute video. What is the literature? This is a video. Intermediate databasing, database searching, this is a video, and then there's an online quiz. So if you wanted, for example, your students to view one video here, one video from tutorial one, and one video from tutorial three, you could act, absolutely mix and match those. Um, the quizzes at, um, at the bottom here of each tutorial, these address uh, the videos that you see above, however. So if you're gonna mix and match, it probably wouldn't make sense to assign a quiz to because that information wouldn't necessarily be covered. So I'm gonna actually walk you through this so it'll hopefully make more sense. So if I go here to tutorial two, it gives you a little bit about the tutorial and then you navigate through next page here at the bottom. And then the first thing you'll see is this first video about peer review. I have um, student learning outcomes listed here and these are outcomes that are addressed in this video. And underneath you'll notice we have vocabulary terms like peer review, scholarly journal, scholarly journal article. And these are terms that are addressed in the video, um, but also terms that as librarians, as we've worked with students over the years, we see as sort of like stuck points or points of confusion or, or things that might need some clarification. <clears throat> so these are really important and these also show up in the quiz at the end. So I'll go to the next page. And I'm plopped into our next video, which is what is the literature. Again, I have some vocabulary terms. Go to the next page. And then this final one is sort of advanced database searching. It covers phrase searching and truncation. We see our vocab and that's the final video. So as students go to the next page, what they see here is a quiz. And this is a quiz that they can do online. Um, it, it's 20 questions, so maybe max will take 10 minutes. 
Um, it's dynamic, so if students answer a question correctly, they will get feedback. <clears throat> and students can take this quiz as, as many times as they would like. After they complete the quiz, they get um, a, a digital certificate appears that has their name um, and also has their score. And what they can do at that point is um, download that, they can print it, they can post it to Blackboard. However you'd like them to get that to you, they can. It's just a, a digital PDF. Um, what I recommend and what I've done with my own courses that I've taught is requiring that students get a particular score because you don't want students to get 20% and then that's it, right? Um, have them take it until they get, for example, an 80% and then they can upload that um, to Blackboard. Some students will, of course, um, take it as, as often as as many times as they can to get 100%, which is great. Um, each, each of these three quizzes looks a little different. The certificate looks a, a little different. So if you decide to assign more than one quiz, you should be able to quickly visually, you know, be able to visually identify which is which in your Blackboard space. Um, by the way, all of these quizzes and materials in the CIL lab, I'm gonna go back here to video tutorials, tutorial two. These are all um, open source or open access, meaning you don't have to worry about proxy linking in the way that you do if you're sharing uh, an article that's behind, that lives in a database or something like that in Blackboard or in an email or however you're gonna communicate with your students, just copy and paste the URL in your browser and then this plops them in. So that's pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's see here. It's 1020, so I have a few more minutes. Um, I'm gonna go back to the library's homepage. And um, I'm going to navigate down to library guides. <clears throat> if you haven't used these before, these can be really useful for a course too. Um, guides are essentially information that the librarians have curated for a topic or a skill. So let me show you so that makes a little more sense. <clears throat> So if you scroll down here, <clears throat> you'll see subjects. And each subject sort of represents a topic. So if I go to chemistry right here, say you're teaching a chemistry class, you'll see I have two. One says Chem 590. That's uh, for a guide part created for a particular course. And so if I open that up, um, my colleague C1 created this, and you navigate through this guide at the top, but she's, she's built this guide essentially to walk students through a particular assignment. So we can do that for you and I'll show you shortly how to actually request a library guide. Go back here. Um, and then we have more generic ones. I won't open this one up, but this one is about how to use SciFinder. So um, if you, if you, that's part of your course, you want students to use SciFinder, you can actually um, share a link, the link, which again, you would just share up here. It's not behind a pay, uh, don't, you don't need to put a proxy link. And this guide will help them use SciFinder. So that's a little more, more generic. It's not tailored to a specific class. Other ones that are really popular here are under citing and writing. And so we have guides for the different citation styles um, that are chock full of good stuff, including examples on how to cite different source types. So um, these are here for you. Also sort of more tricky or hard to find uh, source types. Like if you look over here, we have local and regional newspapers or national and international newspapers. We have a couple um, guides on law, legal research, which I know as a librarian, I will tell you is not easy. Um, same, same with some of our business resources. So always check here. And again, you can just share these with students by sharing the link. Um, if you want um, to work with a librarian to create a guide for your particular course, we can do that just like we can craft an instruction session. Um, so to access, and again, it's a form, we love our forms. <laughs> if you go to services, again, navigate to services for faculty and click request, request a library guide, this will plop you um, into a form um, and actually my colleague Barbara is sort of coordinating this process, but what she'll do is um, look at sort of your subject area and what you want and connect you with a librarian who can um, build something for you and your students. All right, so finally, I want to actually highlight 
me go back to the home page here, a resource that um, we recently created for information literacy and COVID-19. Um, because if you're following it, there's a lot of misinformation out there and really confusing. And I know a lot of faculty are actually incorporating COVID-19 into, um, into their uh, assignments and their classes, which is really cool, right? It's a very, uh, a very relevant thing right now. Um, so I'm going to plop back in here to library guides. And um, what I'm going to do, there are a couple ways to find this, but the easiest probably is to search COVID-19. Oops, actually we'll just search COVID. Here we go. And this first result um, in bold, it says information literacy in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'll go ahead and share this link in the chat as well. So you have easy access to it. Here we go. Um, and this, this resource has, if you look over on the left, um, data and media literacy assignments. Um, most of these are pulled from the New York Times lesson of the day, which was a resource I wasn't aware of until recently. Really good stuff here. So on different topics, and these again, all sort of focus on data or statistical literacy. So these would be really useful if you um, are teaching a math class or something like that, um, or like a media, media class. Um, over this top box here on the right, um, these are some tools to help your students um, identify misinformation and also help them decipher fact versus opinion, which sounds really elementary, right? But I took this second one, this news lit quiz. I did not pass it. <laughs> there was some opinion that I was like, oh, that's a fact. And I was really confronted with my own bias. Um, so this, I mean, this is, it's not meant to be punitive, right? But it's more of a learning tool. I'm especially when we talk about things like cognitive bias when we're engaging with media. So these, um, this first one is just basically a list of resources that students can use like Snopes and fact check. Um, and then this one is that quiz. And then there's also a fact checking video that walks through the SIFT method. Um, so check that out if you're interested in it. And of course, because I'm really interested in critical information literacy, um, this last box that says a bit of framing um, really talks about the importance of not only focusing on skills like knowing fact versus opinion or fake news versus real news, but also asking students to think about sort of the larger media environment and things like deregulation and algorithmic bias and filter bubbles and all of that good stuff. And so I have some um, resources down here that you can check out if you um, want to would like to incorporate that, that piece, which again, I think is really, really important. You need some balance. So um, those were the resources I wanted to show you today. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. I have plopped my email into the chat there. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, my colleague, Eric, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So it's all you, Eric. All right, let me get set up here. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so during this part of the workshop, uh, I'm going to be introducing you to several online platforms to provide, uh, that provide access to digital archival content, including our own institutional repository called CSCOC ScholarWorks. Uh, so let's get started. So over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, many libraries and archives have devoted considerable resources to mass digitized physical photographs, documents and media recordings, to digitally image artifacts and other 3D objects, and to capture and preserve born digital materials such as data sets. As a result of this, uh, the amount of digital archival content available online has increased exponentially over the past several years, allowing for increased accessibility to archival materials previously only available in physical form on site. Libraries and archives typically provide access to this digital archival content in one of two ways. So the first being through open access digital repositories administered directly by the library or archive. And these repositories make content freely and openly available. The second way is through subscription-based databases that are administered by for-profit publishing companies. So the library and archives pay for access to this content and credentialed users must then authenticate to gain access to it. Since most of the digital archival content is made freely available through open access digital repositories, I'm gonna focus in on that today, but I'll also touch upon a few of the paid databases available to you through the library toward the end of the, the presentation here. 
Uh, it's also worth mentioning, uh, it's also worth mentioning that all of the platforms I'll cover today have a very similar discovery and display interface for interacting with the content. So they are all are going to feature a single Google style search box to begin your search and provide multiple options to further refine your search by subject area, format type, date, geographic location, and other elements. The search results are typically displayed with tiled thumbnail images that include brief descriptions of each item. And embedded viewers are available in the interface to zoom and pan images and to stream sound and video recordings. Many even have download options that allow you to save the content for later use. So let's begin with CSUSD ScholarWorks. Um, ScholarWorks is an open access institutional repository that is administered by the Fowl Library and it showcases and preserves the research, scholarship, and publications of CSUSD faculty, staff, and students. Uh, ScholarWorks can be accessed via link on the main page of the library website or directly at the URL listed on the slide. This repository includes an array of materials from theses, dissertations, and research projects to digital archival content from special collections in the university archives, which is what I'll be focusing in on today. So the digital archival content uh, currently available in ScholarWorks generally falls into one of these four categories. So the Arthur E. Nelson University Archives, Regional Newspapers, Historical Photographs, and Oral History Interviews. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at each of those areas. The University Archives is the designated campus repository for records, documents, publications, and other materials pertaining to CSUSB. So beginning with the founding of the university in 1960, the university archives holds materials that document the planning, development, and history of our campus. Some key materials from the university archives that have been digitized and incorporated into ScholarWorks include a full run of the Coyote Chronicle, um, our student newspaper from 1966 to most recently 2020. And this features stories that provide uh, insight into campus life and also the student experience at CSUSB. We've got the CSUSB magazine from 1972 to 2018 that highlights significant accomplishments, major initiatives, and other developments at the university. And finally, the CSUSB Friday Bulletin that ran from 1966 through 1999, which is a newsletter that features information on campus events, community activities, university programs, and academic departments. We've also got several important regional newspapers that are included in the platform. So these include three historical community newspapers. So the Black Voice News from 1978 to 2014, the Inland Empire Hispanic News from 1987 to 2009, and the Inland Empire Business Journal from 1989 to 2014. These newspapers are a rich resource for local history research and contain news coverage of stories, events, and communities not well represented in the Inland Empire's larger news outlets like the Press Enterprise or the Sun. Issues of the 1942 Press Bulletin from Boston, Arizona, documenting Japanese American incarceration during World War II, have also been digitized from library holdings and are included on ScholarWorks as well. In addition to this, uh, ScholarWorks contains two historical photograph collections. So first, we've got the Latino baseball history photographs that document the history of Latino softball and baseball with an emphasis on Mexican American baseball in the US. We've also got the Charles Clayton Howe photographs and these chronicle the Archaeological Survey Association of Southern California's archaeological digs in this region from about 1947 to 1972. Lastly, we've got two oral history interview collections that are available on the platform. So the first is the South Colton Oral History Project that provides accounts of life in South Colton, which is a 1.3 square mile ethnically segregated Mexican American community within the city limits of Colton, California. And these interviews are done with lifelong residents of the area. The other is the Bridges That Carried Us Over project that contained interviews conducted by the Wilmer Amina Carter Foundation, documenting the presence and contributions of the African American community in the Inland Empire. Additional digital archival content is being added to ScholarWorks regularly, um, and the repository will continue to grow in the coming years with new materials that will extend uh, both its coverage and scope even further. There are also several other open access digital repositories available online that can support student research. Uh, one of the most comprehensive collections of digital archival content on the web can be found on the Library of Congress's Digital Collections website. Uh, this website hosts over 400 digital collections containing millions of individual items covering subject areas from American and world history to ethnography, science and technology, and arts and architecture. 
Uh, several featured collections of key historical resources are also highlighted on their website for easy user access. Uh, one of my favorites is their collection of Sanborn maps, as you can see on the slide. So these maps from the late 19th to mid 20th century contain very detailed information about a city's properties and individual buildings and can be an invaluable resource for documenting changes in American cities over time. Uh, the Library of Congress's collection actually includes many cities from the Inland Empire, including this one of San Bernardino featuring its downtown. And these maps can support uh, research in a variety of directions, providing many options for student-based projects. Next, the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA. Uh, they host a publicly available online catalog that contains over 90 million digitized copies of records from the U.S. government's enormous collection of materials documenting important events in American history. Digitized records include everything from documents and photographs to film, videos, and sound recordings. And one of the things I like best about NARS platform is how it presents multiple types of records pertaining to a specific historical event in order to provide more comprehensive coverage of that event. So for example, um, on the slide, you can see, um, you can actually, you know, through their website, listen to President Roosevelt's Day of Infamy speech given after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, and also view his first annotated draft of that message. So from these, rec from these records, you can see the speech originally used the phrase, we'll live in world history, but President Roosevelt crossed that phrase out in favor of we'll live in infamy, which came to be the most recognizable soundbite from that speech. The digital archival content made available on NARA's website make that type of comparative analysis possible, which can lead to some really interesting student research projects. For research focused on the history of California and the Western US, there are two excellent open access digital repositories available. Uh, the first being Calisphere, which is administered by the California Digital Library. Uh, Calisphere for, provides online access to unique and historically important primary source materials in a number of formats from libraries, archives, and museums located throughout uh, the entire state of California. And while the emphasis is on materials pertaining to California and the Western U.S., uh, their coverage does extend beyond this to national and international topics, so it can also be used for some more general research. Similar to Calisphere is California Revealed. And this provides online access to archival materials such as newspapers, photographs, and audiovisual recordings uh, with an emphasis on the latter. Um, all of these materials focus on stories and themes pertaining to the Golden State, so it's definitely California-centric um, and is also best used for student research focused on video and film documentation of our state. So now that I've covered where you can find some digital documents, photographs, and recordings, um, I'm gonna turn our attention to looking at some sites that host data sets. So data sets can take on many forms and originate from a variety of disciplines. For our discussion today, um, I'm going to focus in on two specific types of data sets. So those from the government and also social media data sets. Um, we're gonna start with uh, the US government's open data, which is found on the data.gov website. Here you can find data, tools, and resources to conduct research, develop web and mobile applications, and also to design data visualizations. The data, set contain, the data sets contained on this site originate from federal, state, and local governments, as well as universities uh, located throughout the US. Topical coverage includes everything from climate and energy to education, finance, and manufacturing. Um, once you find a data set that is of interest to you uh, and it's selected, there's going to be a landing page for it that will look a lot like the one on the slide for the historic arrest data from the NYPD. Uh, the data sets are oftentimes downloadable in several different formats from simple spreadsheets like a CSV file uh, to more technical JSON and, and XML output. This NYPD example uh, even has an external link to the City of New York's open data website that provides additional tools for working with the data set like the ability to create data visualization directly through the web interface. Tools like this can be very useful for student research projects, allowing them to more easily analyze and compare data, uh, and even create visualiz visualizations like the pie chart for offenses committed um, that I generated within a few minutes on the um, New York Open Data website. Social media data sets can also be found online and utilized for student research. Uh, the DocNow catalog is a collectively curated listing of Twitter, of Twitter data sets that are generated by researchers, librarians, and archivists. 
The collection currently consists of 118 data sets that contain more than 4 billion tweets. Many of the data sets reflect contemporary environmental health, political and social issues, such as climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, recent congressional elections, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Each data set hosted on the site has an individualized landing page that features a brief description of the data set along with its creator, the subjects and dates cover, and the number of tweets. This page also contains a link to, the, to download the tweet ID set, which is actually only a partial data set, as that is all the Twitter terms of service will allow users to download. You can, however, convert this back into a full data set using the DocNow Hydrator application, which is also available for download on their website. Using the Hydrator application, you can output the full data set into either a CSV spreadsheet or JSON format. This will give you access to all of the original tweet's textual data. So you get the creator, date, tweet text, links, et cetera, anything else that's on there. So everything you see in the tweet on this slide, sorry about that, I think I forgot to advance. Um, so everything you see on the tweet on the slide from the CDC will be exported into spreadsheet form for easy data analysis. So that covers a few of the larger open access digital repositories out there. Uh, now let's take a look at a few of the subscription-based databases containing digital archival content available from the library. These can be accessed from the main page of the library's website under the Choose a Database heading. Um, but keep in mind that since these are paid databases, the library has subscribed to, each database will require you to log in with your Coyote ID credentials for access to the content. So the first one, Academic Videos Online, or Avon, provides access to 68,000 streaming video titles from producers such as California Newsreel, PBS, Bloomberg, Annenberg Lerner, Sony Picture Classics, and others. Ethnic Newswatch provides historical coverage of Native American, African American, and Hispanic American periodicals from 1959 to 1989. And lastly, Hein Online. This provides historical collections such as the Congressional Serial Set, Federal Legislative History, agency reports and decisions, and foreign relations of the United States. Again, all of these are great resources for digital archival content that can support student research in a number of different ways. I think that pretty much covers most of the popular platforms out there for accessing digital archival content. So if you have questions, let me know or feel free to email me 